From Rectangle Health, this is the Modern Practice Podcast, a show that provides you with fresh perspectives and practical advice from industry experts in the ever-changing world of healthcare technology. Every episode, we tackle a timely topic to help you stay current and simplify the business side of healthcare. Without further ado... Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Modern Practice Podcast. Really excited for today's episode as we're joined by Dr. Ben Turnwald, owner of Benjamin Turnwald Dentistry. Ben has been running a successful and rapidly growing dental practice for over 10 years and more recently founded Life Goals DDS to help guide dental practice owners and staff to reach the heights he has. And without further ado, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Happy, happy to have you on the show. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. And before we get into the story of your practice and again, that rapid success, uh, um, can you talk to me a little bit about your decision to pursue a career in dentistry? Was it something you always wanted to do? Did you have dentists in the family? Yeah, for sure. So um, I actually grew up on a farm. I was a big science nerd and I had always had an interest in the sciences. Um, once I got to college, um, as I was deciding sort of which path to pursue, I come from a family of small business owners, no, not dentists, but small business owners. And so I felt like dentistry was one of those paths where I could still own my own business without being part of a, a giant organization, which was important to me because I have that that interest as well, the, the business side of things. And you touched on this just a moment ago. And when you entered the dental field, when how long were you practicing before you decided it was time to, to open your own practice or acquire your own practice? Yeah, so I I sort of bounced around a little bit my first year out of school. I, I was one of those lucky people that graduated during the recession 2009. And I found out very quickly that I I was not going to be the type of person that wanted to work in somebody else's practice for very long. And so I was actually lucky enough to, through my network, finding a doctor that was a little bit older and, and looking for someone to eventually take the reins over his practice. And so I really started to um, start that engagement about a year out of school. So it all just kind of fell in place for me. But I think I I knew, I mean, like I said, I knew before I even went to school that I wanted to own my own practice. So I was willing to do whatever I needed to, to, you know, get experience both with the business side of dentistry and also the clinical side, because both are important. Um, and luckily I had a, a good mentor in the practice that I had started working at. Do you have any doubts or fears when you took that leap? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I graduated with a boatload of debt. Like I said, it was during the recession. Patients weren't willing to do anything even remotely elective. And in fact, I feel like people were having a hard time even spending money on things that they needed to keep their mouth healthy. So there definitely was a lot of fear when I took out the loan to purchase the practice just because I had, I already had a, a, a large debt service with my education. So this was you know, just another giant number. So yeah, there was definitely some anxiety there. I hear that. And so you purchased the practice and when you observe from a management perspective, what did the day-to-day -day business operations look like? Well, I'll tell you when I first purchased my practice, or I should say when I first started working at my practice, because I was, I did kind of do a gradual buy-in as an associate and then partner and then full owner. But back in 2010, I believe it was, when I started at my practice, uh, we were still tracking production and collection numbers on a paper ledger wow. um, every day. We did not have a website. We did not have a credit card swiper. The, the clinical part of dentistry and the customer service has always been phenomenal. That is one thing I'm very lucky, lucky for. But the business side, I think, was ran very, very well for many years and then just kind of didn't keep up as far as the clinical side did, but not the, not the business side. So yeah, there was, I knew as soon as I started working there that there was going to be some, some changes that I would uh, want and also need to make from the business side of things. Yeah. It's very clear. You have a strong business sense and you notice these challenges, these pain points, and 
sort of these inefficiencies on the business side uh, in dentistry before owning the practice itself. You mentioned like it's it's almost as if dentistry has been stuck in a different generation, it, yeah. it's sort of late to adopt tech and, and, and modernize. Why do you think that is? So I think there's like two different paths in dentistry. I think on the clinical side, dentists really like their toys and we're really into tech. And I think most of us, you know, we read the journals and we want to um, offer our patients um, the latest and the greatest. I would say most of, at this, most of us at this point are taking digital x-rays. We're doing intraoral scanning. We're probably starting to use AI. We probably have a laser. So I think on the clinical side, we're doing really well. I think on the business side is where we seem to be stuck in the 80s. Like I said, most of us probably aren't tracking things on paper, but a lot of the inefficiencies from the practice management standpoint just take up so much of our time. And so one of the ways that my practice um, used to be, I would say behind or a little bit stuck old school was we never had an office manager. My mentor was under the sort of philosophy that the owner doctor should be the office manager so that he or she knows what's going on, where the money is going, can't really get, well, it's more difficult, I should say, to have people steal money from you. And so I adopted that ideology. And when my practice was very small, it was somewhat manageable. But as I started to make these changes in the practice and modernize it, I became a victim of my own success. And I very quickly started to realize that I can't be seeing patients four days a week and four to five days a week. And then also trying to deal with payroll and, and the accounting and collections and all of that. So that's where I, I think having that experience was actually a positive for me because I don't think very many doctors these days have the experience of being the office manager and also wearing the clinical hat. Um, and so that really taught me a lot, but it also allowed me to redesign all of my systems in my practice so that we could slowly but surely modernize them at least as much as we could with the technology that is out there. And I think one, one of the major sort of hurdles I think that we all have to deal with is the practice management software out there is really dated on the our, our medical colleagues all seem to have adopted a single EHR that they use and it plays plays nicely with you know if if you're trying to transfer information to different providers and I don't hear a lot of complaints about it in dentistry we all have different softwares mine my practice integrated back in 1992 and we're still using the same software and it's it's you know still the number one as soon as you start patching everything together like that you you lose efficiency and um, and your staff gets overwhelmed and, and then, you know, things aren't utilized as, as well as, as they could be, in my opinion. So I want to get into how your practice started to evolve. And you mentioned it a moment ago, specifically around getting paid for the care you, your staff, your team provide. How is it done at the point where you took ownership and what sort of the state of the union of how it's done now? This is a, um, a system that is actually my most recent, it, it, it's, it's been an evolution over time. This is probably the most recent system that I I did a total overhaul on. You know, we I think we're at the point now where a majority of our patients, we just have to be real that the majority of people are going to pay with a credit card. Um, I think the days are gone when people carry on a checkbook, maybe some of your older patients, but that's, I'm finding that's even less and less. And of course, cash is just not the best best, best way to do business in my opinion either just from a risk standpoint. So I think making it as convenient as possible for patients to make payments, whether it's having the ability to pay online, uh, to do electronic billing, um, to do um, payment plans, it does, does an auto withdrawal. Um, I think that's just where we're, where we're headed or honestly, we're probably already there. I think we just need to really embrace that and try to make the system as efficient as possible, both for patients to use it and also for our teams to use it. Um, and I will say once, once I made it a possibility for patients to make payments online, I got so much positive feedback on that because, you know, I, th I think as you 
as you look at the demographics of your patients, as you go younger and younger down the down the demographic scale, less and less of them are going to want to get a paper statement in the mail and have to write their credit card number on something and mail it back. So, so yeah, I think that was a game changer for us and it's automatic. So it's, it doesn't even, uh, you know, it hits the system without someone having to key it in and that, and that type of thing. All right. When you did implement that change, how did, how did the patients that have been with that practice prior to you taking over and while you're there now take to that change? I've gotten nothing but positive feedback as I've incorporated the tech into the collections protocol in my practice. I mean, even from upgrading from the swipers at the front desk to the chip card readers, and now we can take Apple Pay and Android Pay, the widget on the website, being able to get a text message to pay, uh, an email to pay, those have all been highly praised by our patients. And we've gotten just I don't think I've heard one negative piece of feedback on, on any of the tech that's been implemented as far as how to make payments. Yeah, and what's that do for the staff? Has, has your staff had that same sort of positive reaction? Is it saving them time to you know take on more? Um, how, how's that looking? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one aspect of it is that all of our teams want to feel like they're working in a really good practice that's high tech and is cutting edge. And so I think, I mean, this is just a simple example, but when we got the, the credit card readers that had the, the tap to pay, uh, I could just hear the enthusiasm in my, my business team's voice when they'd be like, oh yeah, you can use Apple pay as well. It just made, I feel like there's that like cool aspect to it as well, where they feel like they're working, you know, they're working somewhere that's cool and hip and um, where you, yeah, you, of course you can pay by Apple pay. So there's that aspect I will say whenever you try to implement probably a new system in general, I've found, but particularly with technology for a certain amount of time, it actually takes your team longer to do what they need to do because it's new. And depending on how complex the software is, um, you know, they get over that hurdle and then eventually they, they can start to appreciate it for the time that it saves them. So I don't, I think um, you know, changing our payment solutions was no different. You know, I got some pushback because it didn't seem to be at the beginning that different from what we had before. But now that now that we're going on about a year of of making those changes, uh, I, I would get major pushback if I tried going back. So, so yeah, I, I don't think that's like necessarily specific to changing your merchant or your or your you know collections. I I think that's just systems in general, which is part of what you have to have a, a good skill set with of helping or allowing your team, I should say, to have some input whenever you change a system, because if they feel like they're just getting something shoved on them, then they, they tend to push back a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. And can I want to shift gears here? So s- staffing shortages, employee retention, burnout have hit healthcare pretty hard among other industries and if we're looking at it strictly from a business standpoint um it could be healthcare or any industry as a leader of an organization as as the owner of an organization how important is it to you to equip staff with tools like that'll enhance their experience their workflows make it easier on them and do you think it makes a difference in attracting and ultimately retaining that staff yeah, so I, I go to a lot of dental conferences and dental meetings, and at every single one that I've that I've went to since we were, you know, allowed to go back, I will say since COVID. I mean, that's the number one thing that everybody's talking about is the team being able to keep your team fully fully staffed, um, particularly with assistants and hygienists. I will say that I've been. I've been lucky. I haven't had a lot of turnover. I have had to hire a lot more so because I, I built a new practice in 2020 and I needed to add a lot of employees. So I, I felt that pain needing to hire. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't lose a lot of people, but I think there's a couple of things that I have found have been really helpful for me. I will say first with retention, I think it's really important to make sure you have a positive, fun team culture, because at this point, our our team members have a choice. There's, you know, there's a, everybody is looking 
for particularly, like I said, assistants and, and hygienists, maybe even in front office teams. So they know that. And so, you know, you don't want to be losing a really good employee for a dollar or $2 an hour when really it could have been probably prevented at the core by just taking a look at the team culture. So things like making sure it's a fun environment for them. Like, uh, do you hear laughs throughout the day? Um, does everybody get along? Does everybody respect each other? Do we have agreements on how we give and accept feedback? Do you, do you allow time for them to do things together socially? Like I sent my team to all get their nails done a couple of weeks ago, um, or we'll go out for happy hours or we'll have a barbecue at somebody's house. And we do stuff like that. And I think it's important for those relationships to develop outside of the office as well, because, you know, you hear the quotes that we actually spend more time with our coworkers than we do with our families. And so it's important that you enjoy the people that you work with. So I think that the team culture is, is really, really important. And for me, what I found was that I hired a, a couple of key players throughout the years who were just like fun, quality employees who just really made a positive impact on the culture in my office. And those are the people that you have to like um, really double down on, make sure that their their ideas are taken seriously and implemented because they tend to be the ones who can, if, if, you're, if you're not a, maybe a, a super, super fun, outgoing person yourself, like for me, for instance, I put on my business hat when I get to the office. And so I might not be the one who's always joking around as much, but I, I will in the right environment, join right into that culture. And so I think it, I think hiring smart is, is part of it. Um, I've always said that, you, that I have hired on personality and not on skill set. Most of the people that have worked for me had zero dental experience and I, and I hired them just because they were they were fun and they were bubbly and they were constantly smiling. And I knew they'd be someone that I'd want to work with every day. And so I think that that is another important aspect of it. And then also just making sure that they're heard. So I think when you're going to be, especially when you're going through periods of growth or change, I think instead of just dropping, dropping these bombs on your, on your team at like a meeting, it's to maybe alternatively, and you can't do this with everything, but alternatively to be like, okay, here's the problem that we're facing. How do you guys want to solve it and make it a discussion as opposed to a, here's what we're going to do. And I found that when the, in, in a lot of times they come up with better ideas than what I could have came, came up with in my little vacuum at home on the weekends. And then it tends to get implemented both faster and tends to stay more implemented because your team was the one that came up with it, um, as opposed to them just being told to do something. So I think those few things are probably the keys that I attribute to my success of not having a lot of turnover. And I think that who knows when the labor market is going to turn around. So I think that, you know, for the doctors out there that are really struggling with retention, I would just take a, you know, a long, hard look at how it is to work in your office and start to change from the inside and then that will attract people on the outside to come in and then you're not having the turnover and it's not the you know the cat chasing its tail it's brilliant and i think i think you get a bunch of hits on your website people look <laughs> at your career section for sure after that i have no <laughs> doubt about it uh, great insight there and if we take a step back look at the way you're implementing and developing the culture within your practices, within your organization, uh, strengthening and giving your, your staff the tools to succeed and for your practice to succeed and make the patient's lives easier and make the staff's lives easier. You know, we don't have to get into exact figures, but what kind of impact do you think that makes on the revenue cycle, your revenue cycle? As far as um, like the patient experience on the team, yeah. Experience. How you have you built and equipped your staff yeah. to, to manage the practice? I mean, I think it's honestly, aside from doing good clinical dentistry, I think that that's literally everything because the your team is who your patients are going to interact with the most. And so if you have a team who is friendly and caring and they have high psychological ownership of the practice where they individually act like owners, like for instance, something as small as there's a little piece of 
impression material on the carpet or a little piece of paper on the carpet. Like it warms my heart when I see my team members bend over and pick that up instead of just walking, walking by because small things like that are what our patients notice. They want to make sure they're in a, you know, in a clean, organized space. And I think people are impressed when they walk in and they're greeted by name, even if it's their first time, if it's their first time there or the amount of time that they get, they're, they're not rushed. If you look at my Google reviews, it's just, I can't believe how friendly everybody is. It's just friendly, 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 friendly in all of our Google reviews. And so that goes down to the team. I think I can be the friendliest dentist in the world, but if if the person who answers the phone the first time someone calls has a scowl on their face, and then they have a scowl on their face when you walk in and you're ignored when you walk in or you're left in a room for a half hour waiting, I don't think it really matters how friendly the dentist is. It, it's a team, it's a team sport. And so, yeah, I attribute the growth and the success of my practice other, other than the, the clinical side, which honestly, I don't think patients can always appreciate it until they're you know, their crown lasts 20 or 30 years. So it's not an immediate, you know, something that they're, they're necessarily grateful for because they can't, they don't really know, but the patient experience, when you, if you can give your patients the ultimate experience each and every time that they come in, that's something that they won't forget. And that's something that they tend to tell their friends about. And so I think that having raving fans in your patients and having them refer their friends and family to you can just be such a catalyst for growing your practice. And also I think preventing burnout and preventing turnover, because usually your biggest fans tend to refer people who are also going to be your biggest fans and are going to be, you know, fun to work with, easy to work with. They pay their bills, they show up for their appointments, um, that type of thing. So yeah, I honestly attribute that to you know, almost everything for the success of my practice is patient experience. And that's another area where I love helping other doctors improve that because I, you know, we talk about being stuck in another generation. People are petrified of the dentist because of how they experienced it as a child. And so I think if we can change that, that's another area where we can really turn these perceptions about going to the dentist around, which again, just makes, makes everybody's lives um, better, especially for our patients. But just even if we can decrease a few people's anxiety just a little bit, I see that as a win. Yeah, absolutely. And I think word of mouth, those referrals are definitely that non trackable type of free marketing when you deliver this exceptional experience through and through. It just happens organically and it's key to growing any business. And it's a perfect segue because we've spoken a lot about you, the practice and how you scaled for growth, but I want to shift to Life Goals DDS. Can you tell me about the organization? Yeah. So I formed uh, Life Goals DDS a couple of years ago as the pandemic was raging and I was finding that, uh, as I mentioned before, I was kind of a victim of my own success with the practice. As the practice grew, I found myself, of course, I was, I was the office manager. I was seeing patients um, full-time and like a typical dentist, I'm the, I'm the person that I wanted an A plus in everything. And so I was trying to uh, um, modernize my practice. I was, I was trying to innovate and change the business side of my practice and practice management. Um, I was trying to give my patients the ultimate patient experience. And I was also trying to do some really complex dentistry. And of course I wanted to do it really well. And what I found is that I was burning the candle at both ends and eventually got to the point where I was, I knew I just, I needed to make a decision because I was burning out. And I decided that I could probably help more people um, by focusing on the business side of dentistry and finding help for my patients um, to replace me for the clinical side, because I feel like I'm a unicorn and most most doctors are more into the clinical side of dentistry and um, prefer not to really touch the business side. They have their business managers for that or consultants or whatever. And so, so yeah, I, I, I decided that I was going to sort of start to shift the pendulum and focus more on practice management, helping other dentists with practice management and uh, kind of decreasing the amount of, of uh, patients that I saw clinically. So here I am. And now I, uh, I, although I do see patients um, here and there, family and friends in particular, 
most of my time now is focused on, on helping other dentists sort of get what I got out of my practice, which was making it more efficient, getting my time back. So I had time to do the things I enjoyed and slowed down the, the pace and ultimately got out of the burnout cycle. Where, where can uh, our listeners learn more about Life Goals DDS? So you can go to my website at lifegoalsdds.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Benjamin Turnwald DDS. And uh, yeah, I'm, I post free stuff um, every once in a while. And you can also join my, uh, uh, my mailing list too. So I'll, I'll drop both the website link and uh, link to your profile in this episode's description um, as we wrap up here. So Ben, I want to lean into some of the key areas of focus at Life Goals, and I'll start with team development. Can you touch on, you know, high level, some of the obstacles you see in front of the practices you consult and, you know, your approach to building a team of rock stars? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just like in dentistry, we talk about things being comprehensive. I think it's a comprehensive solution. As I mentioned earlier, I think the first thing is to take a long, hard look at the culture in your practice and make sure that you really have a fun, supportive, work family type culture, because you can spend all the money on the ads or, you know, trying to find these people, but if they're not going to stay with you, then it's kind of off, off or not. And so I think that that's the first thing. And that's, that's one thing that I, I, I do uh, help with. Second, I think once you have that culture in place, it's portraying it in the, the ads or the posts or whatever it is that you're um, doing to attract the talent. So I think, you know, testimonials from, from your team and a lot of pictures and just truly showing what your practice is all about instead of, you know, maybe having someone go to a generic website. Yeah, I think those are probably the the two most important things for team culture. And then also, um, I think one thing that a lot of practices they uh, struggle with is uh, implementation of, of new systems. And so sometimes just having an outside facilitator to come in and help help these practices just kind of talk it through as to why we need to make some changes and making sure that the team is is involved in it, I think makes a huge difference in the success of it as well. Mom lifegoalsdds.com right now and what i love is that there's this whole story here you paint the whole picture of creating efficiency utilizing the right systems having the right team and a happy team in place and ultimately elevating the patient experience and all that factors into high growth high profit profitability like you've experienced at your own practice so If we look at an established practice with the existing processes and systems in place, before they speak with you, what would you recommend be their first step in assessing the business side of the practice? Well, one of the things that I usually advise people to do is to make sure that you have your your executive board put together. And so that's always something, you know, even if someone doesn't work with me, if they need a referral to put together their executive board, I'm always happy to um, to help with that. But um, you know, it really does take a team. You need a you need a good accountant. You need a financial planner. You need a a good attorney just for certain things. An HR company, and then um, honestly, a mentor, whether it's clinical or business or both. I think being able to pick from you know different brains, different ideas, um, I think is is super important. I don't know if it's necessary as a precursor. But it's definitely something that I suggest that particularly practice owners start to develop over time, because I I really think that that is one of the things that really contributed to my success. And, you know, for those people that are, are, um, are doctors that are familiar with the Pankey Institute, I myself have not experienced the Pankey Institute, but I know that a few of my mentors are graduates of there. And each and every one of them told me that you know one of the core philosophies of of the Pankey Institute was to once it's your turn and you know there's a younger generation below you it's very important for you to you know be a mentor and pass on your knowledge so that we can leave each generation of dentists at least one step ahead of where we started and so um i've i've uh, absorbed that philosophy and have tried to kind of 
pay it forward um, in that same in that same attitude as I have been blessed with with my my great mentors. So that's part of the reason as well why I why I started like Goals DDS. I love that. Ben. I love that. And definitely recommend all of our listeners tuning in today to connect with Ben and uh, take take in all the insights you can from him. The brilliant mm-hmm. mind. And I just have one more question I'd like to ask all of our guests here on the show. And 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 you you you've touched on it a little bit uh, as far as mentor mentorship, but what is the best ad, bit of advice you receive to drive and motivate you or and to reach the heights you have? Oh man, that's a tough one. I would say probably to see um, you know when you trip and fall or when something doesn't go as well as it should to see it as an opportunity to grow and learn from it. I think I've made a lot of decisions, a lot of decisions over the years that turned out to not be the right decision, but I can tell you now, you know, having owned owned a practice for as long as I have that I'm not gonna make those mistakes again. Um, But I think that they were important in my my learning process. Um, And I think along with that, a, a doctor had told me a few years ago, and this makes so much sense to me, is that when you're making a clinical decision, that's kind of how our brains are trained as dentists. And you research, you research, research, research the heck out of something to try to make sure you're making the right decision for your patient or your patients. But when it comes to making business decisions, a lot of times you just got to go with your gut. There's like, there's not a white paper on it. There's not, you know, a solid Google search you can do. I mean, of course you want to do your due diligence, but a lot of times you just got to go with your gut and nobody's going to die if it doesn't turn out. And then you just learn from it and you move on. And so that's part of, that's part of what I like to do as well as I like to share my failures with other doctors and small business owners, because, you know, there's no reason that they should have to make the same mistakes that, that I have. And I think, I think collaboration is key. I absolutely love that. And I don't remember which athlete it was, that I don't lose, I just learn. And what you just said just reminded me yep. of that time. So love that. Totally. Thank you so much for all the insights you shared today. And I really appreciate you taking the jo- time to join me. I hope we can get together again real soon, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. For our listeners tuning in today, if you enjoyed the episode, hit that like and subscribe button on your favorite streaming channel and be sure to leave a review. Let us know what you'd like to hear discussed on future episodes of the Modern Practice Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Till next time, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Modern Practice Podcast. If you enjoyed today's conversation, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or SoundCloud for new episodes. And follow Rectangle Health on social media for more helpful information, news, and event details. Thanks for tuning in.